genetically. It cannot be separated from us without taking our physical life. I know we each bathe daily. And we do that for health reasons. To say nothing of being acceptable around other people that we interact with. And we feel good after we shower. Some of us, of us even put some lotion on. What Paul is talking about here is a contamination that you and I cannot get rid of. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of what? And that's what we have in us. We also need freedom from our personal sins, which dwells in our symbolic hearts, from which also we cannot separate ourselves from. So unless you and I choose to be crucified with Christ, Christ's death on the cross is meaningless. We can sing about it, we can talk about it, we can cry about it, but it's absolutely meaningless. It doesn't do us any good. The crucifixion of Christ is not a one-day event that took place 2,000 years ago. The crucifixion of Christ is a daily event because it deals with a personal issue. The personal issue is the contamination that I have in me. Sin. Jesus himself addressed this issue. He did it in a little different way than Paul is doing. Who would like to read for us Luke 9, 23? Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus is speaking about our experience. Our very personal experience with the sin problem. Who would like to volunteer to Patty? Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Thank you. What is the symbolism of taking up Jesus' cross daily? What is the symbol of that? I have a choice from the moment that I awaken in the morning to the time that I retire at night. To what? Turn every decision, experience, and temptation over to whom? Jesus. Did Jesus do that when he was on this earth? Yes. Did he choose to turn every decision, experience, and temptation over to his heavenly Father? Yes. That's how the faith of Jesus was invented on laboratory earth. And if you think that he did a good job of it, why wouldn't I want to access the faith of Jesus? Why wouldn't I? I either don't understand it, haven't heard of it, or I don't understand the severity of the issue. The only biblical solution to remove the influence of the sin condition is to find someone that will take my condition on them and crucify them. Amen. From prison, Paul writes an interesting letter to the Ephesians. We're not going to look at it now, we're going to look at it later. But I want to discuss the meaning of what, the significance of what we're talking about here this morning. If you believe that Christ was crucified and you and I have the choice now to be crucified in Him or with Him, what have we just decided to do? 
Be saved. And as long as you choose to have that mindset, as long as you have life on this earth, you're guaranteed to be taken to heaven. Amen. It is the faith of Jesus that gave Jesus the victory over the sin problem. And if you and I choose to access that faith, He then is becomes crucified where? In us. Because we've chosen to be crucified in Him. It is not we that live in Him. It is He that lives in us. He uses His faith to live His life through us. And give us victory over the power of who? The devil. Satan. Last week, we... Touched a little bit on 1 John 3, 6. Whosoever abideth in heaven sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him even known. And 1 John 3, 9. If you're born of Christ, and you cannot be born unless you first die in him, it is impossible for you to sin. Some people had a little trouble with that. Let's turn to 1 John 3, 8. 1 John 3.8. 1 John 3.8 is smack in the middle between 1 John 3.6 and 1 John 3.9. And this is the issue. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. Who would like to volunteer to read that for us? 1 John 3.8. Read. <clears throat> he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. Do you believe the Bible is inspired? Yes. Well, we just learned. So what did Jesus do to the works of the devil? By the way, what are the works of the devil? Getting into sin? Isn't that the only way He can remain alive on this earth? He being saved? As long as he gets me, keep sinning, I'm this day of execution. Because his last option was lost at the cross. Jesus chose not to come down from the cross. Right. Did Satan understand that if Jesus would come down from the cross, Satan would have a pass? Yes. yes. Do you know what Satan was doing at Golgotha? Same thing that Judas was trying to do with Jesus. Judas decided, you know, Jesus is not an assertive person. So I'm going to put him in a situation where he has to assert himself and declare himself king. Did Jesus go for it? No. No, not that cross. Satan wanted for Jesus to come down from that cross. Because if Jesus stayed on that cross... That would be his death sentence forever. So that's his last option. Now, the only thing that he has to look forward to is to extend his day of execution as long as possible. And we are looking at his day of execution. If we do not understand 1 John 3 8, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. Victory over sinning has been accomplished. Do you like that? Yes. Now it's important for us to understand the concepts here. Because we also talked last week about 1 John 2.1. Little children, I don't want for you to sin, but if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. You know how some people manipulate that? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. All I have to do is say, I'm sorry. Forgive me. We're ready to go again. Is that what the Bible is teaching? No. Then we have <laughs> Hebrews 10 26, the person that knowingly, willingly, and deliberately continues to sin, for that person, there remains no what? Sacrifice. So, until we drop dead, if we choose to continue to hang on to some sin, 
and then we die, for us there remains no, no sacrifice. But then there is another scripture, and this is the one that I want for us to think about just a little bit. And that's found in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4, 5, and 6. Hebrews chapter 6, 4, 5, and 6. Who would like to read that for us? Hebrews chapter 6, 4, 5, and 6. This is speaking of an attitude. We know that the soul that sinned must die. Right? The question is, what is the motivation for living the Christian life? We know that in 1 John 3, 8, that Jesus has destroyed the works of the devil. Okay, wonderful. But what should my motivation be for living the Christian life? Now, let me you want me to yeah. Hebrews 6, 4, 5, and 6. For it is impossible for those who were once in Thank you. When I live my life and I choose to be crucified in Christ, what am I saying? I don't want to put Jesus to what? And in so doing, re-crucify him. But if I choose to sin, then what am I saying? I'm sorry, Jesus, but I'm going to re-crucify you because I just can't. Live without the sin. Wow. What do you think of that? So the issue no longer becomes what? The issue becomes what? What am I going to do with Jesus? Am I going to be crucified with him? Or am I going to re crucify him? That's the attitude about sin that God wants for us to have. Because sin has been conquered. So now the question is, am I going to access that victory? But what is my motivation? The only acceptable motivation is that I refuse to re-crucify Christ again. I am so thankful and appreciative of what He has done for me. So, since Jesus has not returned a second time, and we are the generation that is living on planet Earth today. What does verse 21 of Galatians 2 say? Has Jesus died in vain? That question applies to the generation living on planet Earth today. That's you and me. Has Jesus died in vain? That question requires an individual response. Because Christ tasted death for who? Each one of us. So each one of us must have Christ's personal experience of dying to self. Or we will not be saved. What I just said is symbolically illustrated in Romans 6, 3 and 4. I invite you to turn to Romans 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. Everybody there? I'm going to quote it to you, and I want for you to follow carefully and make sure that I quote it correctly, okay? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, were baptized for salvation? <laughs> Did I get that right? Yeah. Well, that's why most people are baptized. They want to be, they're baptized because they want to be saved. Nothing wrong with that. It's just the wrong focus at the wrong time. 
I am crucified with, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into whom? Jesus Christ. We're baptized into what? His death. Therefore we are what? Buried with him by baptism into death. That's what the word baptizo means in Greek. It means submerging something under something. Verse 4. What does verse 4 say? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism to death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of whom? God. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. The assumption is there in verse 4. If you are buried with Christ in baptism, what does he do? Raises you he up. raises you up. And now how do you live? Walk in newness of life. In newness of life. You should look up the word life used there in your concordance. There's two uses for the word life in the New Testament. One is the life that we inherit from our great grandparents, Adam and Eve. And the other life is the one spoken of in Romans 6, 4. Zoe. The Greek word. Life in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? That's our choice. That's our choice. So let's begin our study today of, Rome, of uh, Galatians chapter 3 by reading verse 1. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. By the way, any questions on what we covered in the introduction of just verses 20 and 21 of Galatians chapter 2? Any questions at all? Okay, who would like to volunteer to read Galatians, verse 1, chapter 3? Linda? O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? Thank you. Folks, the word foolish is a very, very strong word in the Greek language. It opens the door for someone to sue you. It's a libelous word. In the Greek language, in the Greek language, you call someone a fool and they can sue you. It is a libelous Statement. It's the Greek word spelled M O R O S means stupid. You're a buffon. But Paul is writing by inspiration, so I'm not going to say any more. Who has bewitched you? Paul is asking the converted Christians from the Gentile world and the Jewish world. He's saying, to whom have you now turned to for your spiritual growth? Tell me, I want to hear. Please tell me. The author of the book Acts of the Apostles answers that question very vividly. On page 386 and 387, the title of the chapter is Apostasy in Galatia. If you read the style of writing of Paul, he's very, very tactful. When he wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he's very tactful because he realizes that the Corinthians have been deceived. They haven't had an opportunity to really understand or hear the gospel. So he's very, very tactful. He doesn't want to offend anybody. But Paul's style of writing to the Galatians is quite different. Let me read to you what the author of Acts of the Apostles says about the Galatians. 
The men who had attempted to lead the Galatians from their belief in the gospel were hypocrites, unholy in heart, and corrupt in life. Their religion was made up of a round of ceremonies through the performance of which they expected to gain the favor of God. They had no desire for a gospel that called for obedience to the word. What word? word and God. then she quotes John 3, 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. End quote. Continuing. They felt that a religion based on such a doctrine required too great a sacrifice, and they clung to their errors, deceiving themselves and others. End quote. What is apostasy? What does the word apostasy mean? You went away, you turned. From, you, were you were in good standing and you you went the wrong way. You apostatized. You left. Very good. Very good. The definition from the uh, concordance is, by the way, it's spelled A-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-A -S -S -I -A in Greek, apostasia. It's a defection from the truth. A defection from the truth. Falling away, forsaking a former belief. What does the word belief mean? It's the same word for faith. <clears throat> In a verb form, the noun form is faith. The verb form is belief. You're practicing something now. In this case, what? Unbelief. Who has bewitched you? To what source have you not turned to? With your own eyes you saw Jesus crucified. What does that mean? The Holy Spirit was able through the Apostle Paul to preach the gospel in such a powerful and visual manner that the Galatians actually were able to see Jesus on the cross crucified. How powerful is that? That that is what the Apostle Paul is saying right here. Until you and I see Jesus crucified with our own eyes, we will not be able to experience the reality of the gospel in our individual lives. And it is my prayer that our study of Galatians this quarter will open our eyes so that we can visually see what was involved and under the circumstances that it was involved to bring about our redemption. Okay, let's take a look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Who would like to read verse 2 for us? Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith? What a great question. To whom is the Spirit given? Very good. Let's read it. Who would like to volunteer to read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. seal means. And it's 
also used in Ephesians 1 40 and uh, Ephesians 3 40 and uh, Revelation 7 verse 3 remember Revelation 7 3 speaking of the biblical period of time that we're living in. Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13 talks about the signs in the sky which have been fulfilled. 